right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to the Rocky Mountain MS Center's webinar series. This series is designed to give people with MS information to empower them to make the best choices for their lifelong brain health. I would like to thank the pharmaceutical companies who have provided support for this program. Thank you to Biogen, EMD Serono, Genentech, and Sanofi Genzyme. Today's presentation will discuss two important topics for Colorado viewers, the Paid Medical Leave Act and the Medicaid buy-in program. Our presenter is Tom Stewart. Tom studied as an undergraduate at the University of Notre Dame and studied law at Boston College Law School. After clerking for the New Jersey Supreme Court, he attended Physician Assistant School at the University of Colorado, where he received a master's degree. Tom has been involved in the medical and legal care of MS patients since the mid-1990s. In addition to his direct patient care responsibilities at the Rocky Mountain MS Center at University of Colorado, Tom directs the Rocky Mountain MS Center's Disability Assessment and Legal Assistance Programs. This webinar features a lot of important information. If you missed something on a slide or want to hear it again, we are recording this webinar and it will be archived on our website at mscenter.org so you can replay it at any time. All live viewers will get the recording automatically sent to them. You will also receive a link to our evaluation survey. Please take a few minutes to fill this out as it helps us improve future programming. We'll reserve some time at the end to answer questions. You can submit questions at any time by typing them into the Q&A box on your screen. We will answer as many questions as time allows. Today's presentation is for educational purposes only. With that, I'll turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Kelsey. <clears throat> so today, we, as um, Kelsey said, we'll be talking about two Colorado state-run programs that will help people with chronic diseases like MS stay in the workforce. And has other and may have other applications too. One is a brand new program with protections for uh, people with health, health conditions that may interfere with attendance, namely Colorado's Family Medical Leave Insurance Program. The other program is the Medicaid buy-in program, and this allows people with disabilities to make a relatively high income and yet have access to Medicaid. It also allows people a way to access home care, even if they don't meet the usual very strict financial criteria. So let's start with the Family Medical Leave Insurance Program. So Colorado voters um, approved Proposition 118 in November, in November of 2020, creating a state-run paid family medical leave insurance program. So this program will ensure all Colorado workers have access to paid leave up to 12 weeks in order to take care of their health needs or the needs of their family members with health problems. And there are a few other purposes too, um, such as uh, to take care of a newborn, um, to bond with a newborn, um, and some other issues uh, related to uh, military service um, or um, people who are being uh, sexually abused. Um, so, uh, so here's an overview and I'll just kind of go through the basics of the program quickly and then um, dive into some more details on um, certain areas that are, are important. So what are the benefits? Up to 12 weeks of paid leave. Um, and uh, this, this doesn't start, there's no way to access the benefit until 2024. Um, so it's, it's just, net new, just now being uh, rolled out. Employers are beginning to have to um, pay into the program in 2023, but people can't access the benefits until 2024. Um, people can get paid up to $1,100 a week in wages for their, um, Time for the time that they're not working and they get to keep their job and their benefits while they're um, on leave. So um, I talked about some of these before, what absences are covered. So for our purpose, um, the main thing is to, um, for people with chronic care to take care of themselves or um, for caregivers to do so. And then what does it cost? So this is funded out of payroll taxes. 
it's 0.9% of an employee of an employee's wage, half of which is paid by the employer and half of it is paid by the employee. So as a practical matter, most employees will pay 0.45% of their earnings um, to the family medical leave pro program in premiums. So I think this is a, a, a neat, a good table to understand how Proposition 118, which is now law, um, the Family Medical Leave Insurance Program compares with existing law, which um, includes the FMLA, that's federal law, as opposed to Colorado's um, law, which uh, of course is just law in Colorado. <clears throat> and then there's another program I don't think a lot of people know about for paid leave, and that's the Colorado Mandated Sick Leave, which is started recently in 2021. And so kind of compare and contrast these. But uh, I think that, um, so for um, the Proposition 118, the um, type of leave is to protect yourself um, and family. And then that's the same with the federal program. The Colorado um, mandated leave is just for your own medical needs up to uh, 12 weeks under Proposition 118, and that's the same as the FMLA, and only six days under the um, existing paid leave, leave, um, paid leave program in Colorado. <clears throat> Again, this, you know, the, of course, the um, Proposition 118 is paid, um, which is a very big change from the federal law, which is unpaid. And the, you get, again, with the Colorado mandated sick leave, that's um, paid up to six days. And so time until eligibility, um, employee must make $2,500 in wages to be eligible for the family medical leave insurance. And uh, that is compares very favorably if you're from the perspective of an, of an employee as compared with the federal FMLA, uh, where employees must have worked for 12 months to be eligible. And the Colorado mandated sick leave accrues one hour for every 30 hours worked. And so um, both the FMLA, the federal law and the state law provide um, uh, protections in terms of uh, the job. Um, the Colorado law kicks in sooner, uh, 180 days rather than 12 months. The Colorado law again <clears throat> um, applies to almost every employer whereas the FMLA only uh, generally applies to large employers with 50 or more employees. Um, and then we've already very similar reasons for, um, for leave. So of course the Colorado law doesn't um, repeal the federal law, it's still law in Colorado, but I can't see any further benefit from the FMLA um, for Coloradans. The Colorado law is, seems, superior and makes the federal FMLA generally superfluous. So in more detail, who's eligible? As I said, virtually all Colorado workers. It does not, um, federal employees are not protected by it. Um, employers are allowed to opt out of the plan if they buy an equivalent private plan, but I think that works out the same. Um, Self-employed workers can choose to participate or not. If you're going to opt into the program, then you need to commit for three years. Um, and then local government employees um, may opt out. Um, sorry, the employers may opt out, but the employees may opt in even if their um, employers are not participating. And again, in a little more detail, how, how will the program be, be funded? 0.9% uh, of, uh, of wages, including tips, <clears throat> half paid by the employer and half paid by the employee. So 0.45% of wages is the cost to the employee. And then the um, premiums only apply to, um, to $161,000 or so um, per person, uh, which limits the maximum annual premium for anyone to $1,455. Okay, um, so let's just look at the premiums again um, in here with some specific numbers. So you can see for low earners, um, 
$26,000 a year, their payment in premiums will be about $117 per year. And then you can see it goes up from there. And someone who is a relatively high earner at $156,000 per year will wind up paying about uh, $702 in premiums. And then <clears throat> what about the benefits? How much will uh, uh, employees receive? The amount of benefits is based on a very complex formula re relating the employee's uh, wages to the average wages in the state. I think it's just easier to look at examples than to know the formula. And so if somebody is making uh, $500 per week, then their maximum benefit if they take the 12 months is $5,400 um, in, in a year. And that replaces almost all of that worker's wages. Um, so for a high earner who's making, let's say $3,000 at the bottom of my chart, um, they will be receiving much more money um, over the course of a year for their 12 weeks if used. Um, 13,200 is their maximum benefit. But as you can see, um, the percent of weekly wages is only 37%. So it certainly does not replace the high earner's salary, although the high earner will get more money on a weekly basis. And so what are the job protections? So the job, job protections, um, again, are available after the first 180 days. Um, people who return after leave are entitled to return to the same position or position with equal seniority status, employment benefits, and pay. Employees are entitled uh, to their health benefits, medical insurance, during their leave, but are required to pay their portion. So usually um, a, an employer and an employee will split the cost of medical insurance. So the employer has to continue to make payments as before, and the employee is expected to make the payments that were deducted from their um, payroll. Uh, and then, of course, employers may not discipline or take retaliatory actions against employees for requesting um, or using paid leave. So I was thinking to make this practical for people with MS, you know, how can the FMLI protect someone with MS? <clears throat> of course, during an MS exacerbation, instead of unpaid time off, people will be able to um, get an amount, the amounts that we were just talking about during the period of their exacerbation until they're ready to return to work. Um, and they should be able to return to their job as before without any punishment. Um, also, uh, intermittent treatment. So, so let's say somebody needs monthly infusions, such as Tysabri infusions, the, and needs to take a day off for that. <clears throat> that should be paid time now as opposed to um, unpaid. And then um, I think, and, and, and why is that so important, I should add, that um, if somebody misses one or two days per, per uh, month, then that person, most vocational experts would say, is not employable, um, would um, be fired. Um, but for laws like the FMLA and the FMLI program in Colorado, so not only is it paid time off, it's uh, guarantees that you won't be fired for doing things like getting your infusions or going to physical therapy. And then um, finally, I think it's helpful to think about that in terms of you know good and bad days. Many people, especially as they're having a lot of trouble staying in the workforce, have what I've heard people describe as good and bad days. In other words, some days they're really, they're fatigued and other symptoms are so severe that they just need to stay home. And in the past, they might not have been able to um, take the day off if they weren't protected by the FMLA and may be at risk for getting fired for too many absences. Um, and for large employers, the FMLA, the federal law, protects them from getting fired for it, but that doesn't help everyone. There are a lot of people who can't afford to take days off from work because of MS, it's bad days. Um, and this law should help considerably 
um, for those people. So I think this is a big, a big, uh, a big change and very helpful for patients with MS, especially those who are struggling a little bit with work. So let's move on to um, the Colorado Medicaid buy-in program. So this is not a new program, but I don't think it's very well known, poorly used, um, underused, I should say. Um, and many states um, have Medicaid buy-in laws, but none of them are even close to as generous as the Colorado's program. Uh, so think about uh, why this uh, might matter. Let's try to think of another example of uh, for someone with MS. Let's assume someone with MS experiences uh, significant fatigue and can't work a 40 hour work week anymore, but she can work uh, independently for herself or through contracts and earn 50,000 per year. That's great, but how would she get medical insurance if she's working for herself? It's available through the exchanges, but it's very expensive. It might cost a thousand dollars a month or more, and it may not be very good insurance either. Um, she might choose not to work at all and apply for disability benefits um, in that so, sort of a scenario um, due to insurance considerations. But um, this is where the Medicaid buy-in might be a great solution and motivate her to stay in the workforce. For her, um, Medicaid through the buy-in program, in this example, assuming about 50,000 a year, would cost about $2,400 per year for Medicaid. And Medicaid, maybe it's um, counterintuitive, but Medicaid is really excellent insurance, maybe the best insurance. Um, and so this might be, this would be an excellent tool for somebody who needs to work on their own for whatever reason, including that they can't keep a regular 40 hour schedule, but still wanna work, can work and be productive. So what are, what's the, what are the eligibility requirements? So you must be uh, 16 or older and employed. More about that later. Um, you have to have a qualifying disability. So if Social Security has found someone disabled, they're disabled for this purpose. But other people, even if you've not been found disabled, might be found disabled. Um, as they apply for this program, it goes through a state disability determination vendor, so other than Social Security. Um, and they will apply Social Security's regulations to see, if, um, to see if you're disabled without factoring whether or not you're working. And that's a big issue for Social Security. If you're applying for Social Security, you can't be earning over a certain amount of money, which is not very much, about $1,300. $50, um, but this will evaluate somebody's function without regard to whether they're making any money. <clears throat> and uh, then um, people can make a lot of money and yet be eligible for Medicaid. I was surprised when I looked up to find out what that maximum was, that some people might earn $10,000 a month and qualify for Medicaid if, they're, if they have a disability. So the most important um, eligibility criteria really are the ones that are missing that are in present are present in almost every other in every other state. So there's no income minimum. What does that mean? So that means if somebody dog sits weekly for ten dollars a week, that counts as working or opening mail one day a week. Um, and then if they're, if they are disabled, the found is already determined disabled by the social security administration, or, um, even if they're not, and they apply, they might be found disabled using social security's rules. And then, um, they'd be eligible for Medicaid. So let me see something. Okay. 
So how, what, how much does it cost to buy in? You can see that here based on monthly income. For this, this chart only goes up to $5,000 a month. So somebody who's making $60,000 a year and is disabled or can be found disabled. And what does that mean in this context? Probably an inability to work a 40 hour work week on a reliable and consistent basis. So um, if somebody's eligible for um, Medicaid because they're disabled and they're earning $60,000 a year, um, then they would be able to buy Medicaid for $200. Okay, so what, you know, what are the benefits of Medicaid? We've talked about one already. One is just getting access to Medicaid, which is inexpensive, even for people who make $60,000, and generally excellent insurance, although some medical and other providers don't participate in Medicaid, so there might be some limitation in choice of clinicians. And then this is really poorly understood and underused. With the Medicaid buy-in program, if somebody needs services in the home, then those services may be available through Medicaid um, and without going through the usual very strict rules um, to qualify financially. So let me show a different slide and maybe that will become more clear. So it may be surprising that there are different Medicaid programs and I'll just kind of uh, compare these. So regular Medicaid, you don't need at the bottom at disability level, right? There's no disability level required. Basically, low earners are entitled to Medicaid. That's just under the Affordable Care Act. Nothing to do with disability. But home and community-based service Medicaid, that's how people access nursing homes, um, you know, especially elder care, um, uh, or older people, let's say with dementia, they usually qualify for Medicaid, for, for nursing home or in-home services through the home and com community-based services Medicaid, which is the second column here. And you can see there are very strict requirements for income and especially assets. So for a single person, if they have more than $2,000 excluding a modest home and a car, so an IRA, <clears throat> um, bank account, life insurance policies, um, then they would not be eligible unless they made a trust. And usually that would mean um, going to an organization like the Colorado Fund for People with Disabilities, which is a nonprofit um, organization that helps people in that situation, or finding in the community a lawyer who does so-called um, elder care and they help people with trust to access the home and community-based services program. But what's fascinating is that I think that people can access the home and community-based services, right, in-home services, if they're found disabled and they're working. And so what does working mean? We already talked about that a little. It means somebody may have a nominal job, such as sitting with a dog for $10 a month. And you can see here, there's on the, on the um, chart, there's no asset limit. And so if somebody's disabled and working and needs in-home services, so which would help people with um, activities of daily living, such as helping with um, showers or toileting, um, other hygiene issues, light housework, um, cooking or meals, um, depending on the circumstances, um, all of that um, with, is available through the Medicaid buy-in program as long as somebody meets the few criteria that I've already described. And so the, the issue is, of course, if someone is found disabled by the Social Security Administration, they're already eligible if they have a job, if they can get a job. As we discussed, um, that job requirement is not strict. Um, uh, but um, if somebody's not been found disabled because they're still working, um, I think the, the rules, I mean, although Social Security's rules are famously strict, in my experience, um, 
finding people eligible for the Medicaid buy-in program um, is something that is done more readily than allowing people, finding people disabled for purposes of receiving social security. That's just, I can't prove that. That's just, um, those are just anecdotes that I've come across. Um, I can think of a number of cases where people really didn't have very severe disabilities, um, but they, and, and I would question whether they would get social security disability insurance and they were able to be found disabled for purposes of the Medicaid buy-in program. So um, that's all I really had for today. Um, I hope, I know some of this information's tedious or, or dry, but have, um, but also has pretty profound protections in them for uh, people with MS. So if, I'll turn this over to Kelsey. Thank you, Tom. Um, you guys can continue to submit questions into the Q&A and we will answer what we can. Um, the first question comes in, can someone with MS that has adequate finances to retire before they are eligible for Medicare buy into Medicaid if they retire earlier, say at 58 years old? Yes, if they're found disabled. So MS isn't, having MS isn't enough. So it's having MS and being found disabled by um, the Disability Determination Services vendor in Colorado. So you apply through the county and then the county hands it off to, their, to this group that will make the decision about whether you're disabled. And that's what I was saying is, I think that um, it's easier to be found, even though the rules are supposedly the same, I think it's easier as a practical matter to be found disabled for purposes of the Medicaid buy-in program than it is for the Social Security Disability Insurance Program. Um, so, so yes, that would work if you're disabled. And you know, the one definition of disabled is um, being unable to work a 40 hour work week on a reliable and continuous basis. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, that actually answered um, another question as well. What does the process look like for qualifying as disabled um, through the determination vendor? Do you have anything else to add to that? No, I, I had uh, on my slide here, uh, I don't think I even showed it, but when in doubt, apply. If you think you, you know, if you have some limitations that interfere with work, apply. Um, I've I've been surprised at who has been found disabled for purposes of the Medicaid buy-in program. And does applying for the Medicaid buy-in program impact an ongoing disability insurance application? No, it might be. Depending on where you are in the process, it might be better just to wait because once Social Security says you're disabled, then you are. Um, but no, I think you can probably apply for the Medicaid buy-in program sooner, um, so before you're found disabled. That is, I just don't know if it will speed things up at the you know, by the, when all is said and done. But yeah, I, think, I don't see any reason you couldn't do that. Um, and moving back over to the family medical leave. Um, how does that work for companies that the company is not based in Colorado, but the employees are living in Colorado, like remote work and what? Great question. I looked up the other, the flip of that in anticipation of a question, but I didn't think of that version. So I wondered about people who work out, who work for Colorado employers, but live outside of the state. I don't think that the person who lives in Colorado and has an out of state employer would be eligible, but I'm not sure. I would contact the Department of Labor in Colorado and see if there's an option to buy in in that situation. I don't think the employer would have to contribute, but I bet I, I, I don't know if the employee might be able to opt in because he or she lives in Colorado. Um, I, and, and, you know, I should also take note here that I mean, because this hasn't really started yet, there, uh, there are unanswered questions. Um, I think that might be one for now, but um, I don't know the answer. So I would call the Department of Labor to look further into that. Good question. To confirm a point you made earlier, when an employee is opting into a program, 
they are committing to three years of paying in? Well, the, um, self-employed people is what I'm saying, right? So the employee doesn't have to opt in for any particular amount of time. They're just paying, it just comes out of their payroll. But if you're um, self-employed, you have to commit to three years. Otherwise, I guess the idea is, you know, you just wait until your wife's about to have a baby and then um, sign up and then get benefits for 12 weeks and then opt out again until you think you need it again. So I think that's why that rule's in, in effect. Um, what does the wage calculation look like for tipped employees? So tips are included if they're managed by the employer. So I don't exactly know a lot about that, how that, the different industries, but I don't know, like casinos, I think they pool all the tips sometimes in Las Vegas and those would count. I don't know if, if you just get tip money on the side and it's not reported anywhere, I don't think that would be included in any of the calculations. That is all of the questions that we have submitted now. Um, Tom, do you wanna put your phone number back up on the screen? Um, if folks have further questions, um, you can also email us. My email address is education at mscenter.org. Um, and we're always happy to get you guys the answers you're looking for. So uh, thank you, Tom, for your time today uh, and these great updates for folks in Colorado. Thank you.